On this episode of Babbage, we're speaking to John Pendry, a professor of physics at Imperial College London, whose work on the interaction between light and matter has led to some very practical inventions, not least a new class of materials known as metamaterials. Metamaterials enable seemingly impossible things to happen. I first met John almost 20 years ago, just after he'd published one of his most important papers. It described a material that could make an object invisible by eliminating any reflection and also removing an object's shadow. A team of experimental scientists later made the material that John had suggested and proved that it really did make things invisible, to radio waves at least. In this conversation, prepare yourself to be transported to the cutting edge of theoretical physics and how you think about space and time. John Pendry, thank you for coming to our podcast. It's a pleasure. In a couple of sentences, how would you describe what a metamaterial does compared to just a normal material that interacts with light? Normal materials, um, their properties are due to the chemistry. And what metamaterials do is to realise that in addition to the chemistry, you can uh, introduce uh, variants of the structure. And that adds another dimension, an infinite dimension, to your, your properties to produce new materials and indeed to produce materials with properties which had never been seen before and do not occur I in nature. So adding structure to the chemistry uh, is, is the power of a metamaterial. So a normal interaction with a material is, like light's interaction with the material is dependent on the, the sort of chemical bonds between different um, elements inside that material and they will move or refract the light into interesting mm -hmm. ways. But you're talking about metamaterials which are structured differently. What are they doing to the light to make them do interesting things? You can think of a metamaterial as a sort of machine um, and when the light enters the metamaterial, um, it encounters the structure of the metamaterial and its energy for a short, very short time uh, vanishes inside the material. It's absorbed by the electrons chiefly um, in, in that material. And then the electrons behave in a way which is dictated by the structure. So I think we're ready to maybe move on to the next um, sort of bit of the bit of your work, which I think ca captures the most public attention, which was um, this idea of invisibility. So it was a essentially you you called it an invisibility cloak when you first mentioned it, but I'd like to know where that idea came from, um, and 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 what you mean by create using metamaterials to create invisibility. Well, the recipe, um, what we need to do to create a cloak, has been uh, understood for quite a while. I think H.G. Wells um, talked about... He didn't know about metamaterials. Though. No, no, he didn't. Oh, true. Um, but, so, to, to, to put it in context, what, what you need to do to make something invisible is, first, it mustn't reflect light, um, but black is not enough. Um, because a black object has a shadow. After all, if you play squash, you play squash with a small black ball, and it's very visible against the white balls of the squash court. And what, so you know where the ball is because of its shadow. So you, you have to do a Peter Pan thing and make the object lose its shadow. And um, when, when the object has lost its shadow, is truly invisible. And that's a challenge. I, I mean, that's not an easy thing to do. So where did this idea come from then? The idea came about as a sales pitch. <laughs> what was the best way? <laughs> a sales pitch. Because we had some rather abstruse theory called transformation optics. So we had to find something you could do with this that would really, really surprise people. So let's go back to this idea that, uh, or demand that, that you, you have to um, remove the shadow. So that means that uh, you, you, you mustn't be careless with light that strikes an object. Uh, you have to surround it with a cloak that uh, 
takes that light and very carefully curates it so that it doesn't hit the object, in which case it would reflect or be absorbed or be lost in, or changed in some way. And then you have to guide it around that object and release it from the other side so that it's traveling in exactly the same way as it did before. Um, and what's more, you have to do this for every possible ray of light that could strike the object from any direction. So the idea is that this would be a material, an invisibility cloak would be a material that surrounds an object mm -hmm. and allows light from behind the object to move around it yes. in such a way that it, it's as if it's not been altered at all. Mm -hmm. This is great in theory. <laughs> this is great in theory. And, and, and the maths, as you demonstrated, is, is, was something that could potentially work. Talk to me about how it was realised in real life. So that was 2005, I think, wasn't it, when you talked about that initially at a lecture yes. so, um, for, for, for the Defence Advanced <clears throat> Research Projects Agency, that famous organisation that comes up with all sorts of crazy ideas. <laughs> but, but, but it has been incredibly important for science. Um, so, so you came up with this pitch for that lecture, and then how did it become... How did an invisibility cloak, how did these metamaterials then become something real? At my lecture to the DARPA meeting in San Antonio, um, where I just wrote down a very simple formula and said, if, if you can uh, make a ma uh, material according to this recipe, then you'll make anything inside it I I invisible. Uh, and by the way, you probably can because we have these new materials called metamaterials, which uh, are capable of realizing this theoretical demand. Um, now, I'd already um, been in contact with and knew very well uh, the group of David Smith in San Diego at that time. And um, he, he, David had then moved uh, to Duke University and immediately he, he, he gave me a call and said, uh, we want to build this stuff. Can, is that a, a, well, yes, of course. And um, they, they built the, the first cloak. It wasn't a cloak for light. It was a cloak for radar waves. It turns out that um, it's much easier to make metamaterials that interact with radar waves than it is to interact with light because the length scales are all bigger. So, so things are cheaper and easier to do more. Also better. more useful for, I can imagine, people who want to hide from radar, <laughs> which, 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 well, which, which are aeroplanes in the military. Yes, uh, that, that is true. So it was only a few months after we published the theoretical paper that the experimental paper came out. And my, my original evil plan, which was that we, we, we wanted to draw attention to these two things we had, which were metamaterials and transformation optics, um, it succeeded spectacularly. Whose idea was it to call it an invisibility cloak, which is what J.K. Rowling used to describe oh, the cloak okay. that, uh, that Harry Potter used, of course? Yes. Well, um, being a crusty old professor, I, I had not heard of J.K. Rowling. Uh, but when, when I uh, told my wife what, what we're up to, she said, oh, you mean like Harry Potter? <laughs> Is that Ooh, right? hoo, sort of thing. <laughs> so at that stage, I realized that we were really onto a good thing because uh, every child in the land, I think. So that was the key. That was I the key. I wonder what it was like when you first came up with these ideas, when you published those papers in the early 2000s, you know, these theoretical papers to say these things may be possible if you build hmm. structures that can manipulate light or, or electromagnetic waves. Did everyone just go, oh, of course? No. <laughs> no, they didn't. What was that like? People didn't believe it was possible. And I, I, I've, I've mentioned before that it sounds a very simple thing to say that the light goes this way rather than that way. And why should it matter that it crosses this normal and turns to a negative angle? And it it doesn't do to dismiss this this as trivial, and it turns out that there are many many subtle consequences, and I I spent a lot of time trying to understand it myself. Um, some people 
didn't understand it at first, and they 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 said, well, there's this paradox. Uh, the, 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 if, if you have negative refraction, then the light does this, and that's an impossible thing, so you can't. I, it was a big thing to say. So how, how difficult was it to sort of keep ploughing this furrow, uh, to sort of continue following this, this idea? Um, it succeeded eventually, of course. We're, we're here talking now about all the successful things that have come from it. But were there times when you thought, you know what, uh, this, this is too much? I, I never lost faith in the idea, partly because I knew that when it was published, it would cause controversy. Um, and therefore, I spent a, a, quite a lot of time, several months, talking to my colleagues who were perfectly capable of being rude to me, but wouldn't do me down in, in, in any way. Classic scientific sort of debate there. Yes. And they were sceptical in the first instance, uh, and I asked them to pick as many holes in it as they could, and, th and they didn't succeed. So uh, I was pretty confident that it had been looked at by some fairly brainy people who, who would have um, called it out had it been wrong. So when the, the tidal wave of um, criticism erupted you prepared uh, i i was so uh, quite robust in in my response to it i think when it got a, a bit personal and it did um i think that was more difficult um and you you have to uh, ask yourself some questions such as how do i respond to this do i respond in kind are there some words I could use in <laughs> response. Uh, and I, I, I realized very quickly that if, if you can take, take the root, root of good manners and give scientific advances to abuse, then you're going to win that one. I just find, I find it odd that um, it, would, it would get personal when in, during a scientific debate. I mean, perhaps I'm what? Maybe, maybe I'm what? too naive, but <laughs> yes. uh, just uh, attack the idea rather than the person, right? Is no, that not how no, it works? No, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, scientists are just as emotional. They're mean people, are they? <laughs> uh, well, they're human beings, <laughs> yeah. and so you get a variety least, of pe people. <laughs> at least you didn't have social media 25 years ago, which would have been even worse. Ah, yes. Hear more about how John Pendry's physics of invisibility leads to a range of applications, including recreating in a laboratory the conditions at the edge of a black hole. You can listen to the full episode of Babbage if you click the link in the description below.